season of mists and mellow fruitfulness, close possum friend of the maturing sun, conspiring with him how to load and bless with fruit the vines that round the thatch eaves run, to bend with apples the mossed cottage trees and fill all fruit with ripeness to the core, to swell the gourd and plump the hazel shells with the sweet kernel, to set budding more and still more later flowers for the bees until they think warm days will never cease, for summer has overbrimmed their clammy cells. Who hath not seen thee oft amid thy store? Sometimes whoever seeks abroad may find thee sitting careless on a granary floor, thy hair soft lifted by the winnowing wind, or on a half-reaped furrow sound asleep, drowsed with the fume of poppies while thy hook spares the next swath and all its twined flowers. And sometimes, like a gleaner, thou dost keep steady thy laden head across a brook, or by a cider press with patient look, thou watchest the last oozings hours by hours. Where are the songs of spring? Eh, where are they? Think not of them, thou hast thy music too. While barred clouds bloom the soft dying day and touch the stubble plains with rosy hue, then in a wailful choir the small gnats mourn among the river sallows, borne aloft or singing as the light wind lives or dies, and fully grown lambs loud bleed from hilly burn, hedge crickets sing, and now with the treble soft the red breast whistles from a garden croft, and gathering swallows twitter in the skies. The poem is written as an ode, defined by Poetry Foundation as a formal, often ceremonious lyric poem that addresses and often celebrates a person, place, thing or idea. The poem has three clearly defined sections corresponding to the divisions of a Greek choral ode, a strophe, an antistrophe and an epode. The stanzas differ from those of other odes in that they use 11 lines rather than 10 and have a couplet before the concluding line. Each stanza begins with a rhyme scheme of A, B, A, B followed by C, D, E, D, C, C, E in the first and C, D, E, C, D, D, E in the next two. The greatest odes of the 19th century were Keats's 1819 odes on a Grecian urn, on indolence, on melancholy, to a nightingale, to psyche and to autumn. They are believed to be a result of Keats's effort to develop a new structure for the lyric poem. To Autumn was one of Keats's final works written only months before his death and inspired by his walks in Manchester. Many of the quintessential aspects of Romanticism are evident in the odes, the idealizing of nature, the exploring of the transience of human life, the magic of imagination and a touch of sadness. To Autumn is a delightful poem and a different take from the usual interpretation of the season as one of dreary coldness. Autumn is a season of mists and calm prosperity. Together with the sun, it blesses the vines that wrap around the roof with fruits, the apple trees with enough apples to bend over, swells the gourds and plumps the hazelnut, and grows enough flowers for the bees that they think summer hasn't drawn to a close. In the second stanza, Autumn is given the form of a woman and who hasn't seen her sitting on the granary floor with her hair fluttering in the wind, or on an undulating hill lost in the scent of the poppies with her scythe cast aside, or picking the last stalks by the brook, or by a side of press with the utmost patience. And while the songs of spring may be long gone, the music of autumn is around. There is the wail of the gnat, the bleat of the lamb, the song of the cricket, the soft treble of the red-breasted bird, and the twitter of the gathering swallows, and all of it against the clouds that decorate the skies of the dying day and tinge the plains rosy. The setting of the first stanza is characterized by growth under the influence of the sunlight and is a nice expansion of time in some sense from summer to autumn. The second stanza emphasizes on the abundance and ripeness of the season between its description of autumn, the woman, and the harvests. Everything is tied neatly together in the final stanza with powerful auditory imagery, the universal language, music. The language is magnificent, painting a picture in mere lines, which one supposes is poetry, but this ode is an ode to everything that is beautiful about evocative descriptions and especially of nature. If at all the allure of autumn were to be captured in art, this ode is where the search stops. <laughs>